now today. Um, my name is Selva Shami, and I'm the assistant director at the Montclair Public Library. Um, so today, we are with uh, Marcy Dermansky, um, who will be in conversation with Kate Tuttle. Um, Marcy is the author of novels Twins and Bad Marie. Her third novel, The Red Car, was a New York Times edition editor's choice pick and named a best book of the year by BuzzFeed, the San Francisco Chronicle, Flavor Wire, and the Huffington Post. Her latest novel, Very Nice, is what we'll be discussing today. Uh, Marcy has received fellowships from McDowell and the Edward Alby Ranch. She's the winner of the 2002 Small Mouth Press Andre Dubu Novella Award and the 1999 Story Magazine Carson McCullers Short Story Prize. Her stories have been published in numerous literary journals, including McSweeney's The Alaska Quarterly Review and the Indiana Review, and included in the anthology Goodbye to All That, Writers on Loving and Leaving New York, and Love Stories, a Literary Companion to Tennis. Um, Marcy lives in Montclair with her daughter and is friends with Kato. <laughs> um, Kate, this is the most important thing that you need to remember. <laughs> They're friends. Kate is a former uh, president of the National Book Critics Circle and a uh, books columnist for the Boston Globe. Her reviews, interviews, and essays have also appeared in the Los Angeles Times, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and National Public Radio. Kate was the senior executive editor of the African American National Biography by Oxford Press. Prior to that, she was the managing editor of Africana.com, a daily updating online magazine focusing on worldwide black culture. A native of Kansas, Kate now lives in Montclair with her family. I just want to put a plug out for the library that in September is National Library Card Sign Up Month. So if you do not have your library card, you can always get one uh, by going over to the checkout desk or you can even apply online by visiting our website, MontclairLibrary.org. We would like to uh, send a thank you to Watchum Booksellers. Um, they have a table out in the lobby with Marcy's books for sale in the cafe. Um, if you haven't already bought, very nice, and then her other books are out there as well. We would like to thank our series sponsors, the Montclair Foundation Investors Foundation, for their continued generous support. Special thanks to Central Presbyterian Church, our in-kind sponsor, who will once again be hosting an open book event at their location in November, and that will be um, B.H. Shapiro, no, is it Jody Cantor? Okay, November 22nd, Jody Cantor and Megan um, Tuggy and Matt Purdy um, will be talking about the book She Said, Breaking the Sexual Harassment Story that helped ignite a movement. Um, so, yes, we would like to, um, let me see. Okay, so for, for a full list of our upcoming conversations, please see the library website where you can take a flyer when you exit. So, uh, let's welcome uh, Marcy. Rachel shrugged. Sometimes I thought there was something wrong with my daughter. There was a flat in 
sense to her that I found unnerving. It was like she had a switch, an on-off mode. Even when she was a girl, she would want to sleep in my bed, hug me like there was no one else, and then gleefully go on to another girl's house for a sleepover. And like that, I did not exist. On, off. I knew intellectually that my 19-year-old daughter was not a sociopath. She was the way that she was, but I never knew which daughter would wake up in the morning. I had been planning to pick Rachel up later that day from the train station, but instead she arrived hours early, sweaty, pulling her suitcase and this dog on a leash. It was a gorgeous dog, long legs, apricot colored fur, an expensive dog. Rachel, I said, whose dog is this? My writing professor, she said. My daughter had been excited about taking his class. She had been required to submit a story to get in and was over the moon when she was accepted. He had to leave for the summer because of a family emergency. I told him I would take care of Princess until he gets back. I know you miss Posey. I miss her too. Rachel was aware of me staring suspiciously at the dog, tears welling in my eyes. At least she wasn't an idiot. She also didn't mention her father. Isn't he from Pakistan, your writing professor? You remember that? I wondered why I remembered that. He was striking his author photo. He had these dark eyes. That's a really inappropriate way to talk about a writer, Rachel said. Is it, I ask? Isn't that the point of an author photo? <coughs> Rachel looked at me with that blank expression. You talked about him a lot in the beginning of the semester, I said, and I read his book. Did you like it? It was long, I said. I wanted to like it. Even the sentences were long. I know it's supposed to be a masterpiece. I read review after review, and no one complained about the sentences. I think there's something wrong with both of us. This often happened. We did not stay mad at each other for I wanted to chew my daughter out about this dog, and instead I was talking about her professor's overridden novel. No, I said, we appreciate short sentences. His book just might not be for us. The poodle was panting. It was a hot day, 90 degrees in June, too hot for June. Global warming was here, and life went on. As humans, would we learn to adapt? Here I was, adapting. I wondered how Rachel felt about her father leaving. She had said he was no, she was no longer a child, that her feelings on the subject were consequential, whereas my feelings had been hurt. Our perfect family had come apart, and my daughter did not care. She was just like Pierre from that Morris Sendak book. I would have fed her to a hungry lion if I could. I knelt down and petted the beautiful dog she brought home. I scratched the poodle under her chin. It was ridiculous. Could I fall in love with a dog that quickly? It's going to be fine, Mom, my daughter said. I'm going to walk her. I will feed her. It's a big house. I heard echoes of my seven-year-old girl begging me for a bunny telling me she would feed her, that she would clean her cage. That same little girl who quickly lost interest in that same bunny, who became my responsibility, another household chore, until the bunny escaped from her cage and was cornered by Posey in the living room. That poor little bunny died of a heart attack. My professor was leaving and I offered to take her. He was going to let a subletter take care of her, a stranger who works 12-hour days. I sighed. It didn't matter that I was not ready to have another dog in the house. I wouldn't want this wonderful dog inside alone in an apartment all day. I wasn't even sure if I wanted my daughter home, but here she was, standing in my yard. Bring her inside, I said. Let me get her some water. She must be thirsty. Why don't you ask me if I'm thirsty if I'm hungry? You're a big girl, I said. You can take care of yourself. I can't, Rachel said. I'm desperately unhappy. I looked at my daughter, and I didn't know if she was telling the truth. I didn't know if I was supposed to hug her, if that was what she wanted. I could, of course, go ahead and hug her, but there was a chance that she would just stand there, stiff as a board, and I wasn't ready for that kind of rejection so early in the day. She did not look desperately unhappy. But what if it was true? Was I supposed to take care of her all summer? She told me last week that she was thinking about not coming home, that she would stay in her college town and find a job there, and I told her that would be fine. I'd sort of like the idea. Rachel already had a job at the day camp, her third summer job in a person done in a row. I had seen the director at the farmer's market, and she told me that she couldn't wait for the summer season to start, that my daughter was such a good counselor. The kids always loved her. I loved her. Fuck it. I was glad she was home. Let's get you both something to drink, I said. And you know what? I'm going to just skip to the end of the chapter, um, because it's more fun to answer questions and talk to Kate. But basically, the daughter didn't turn in a student. Her, she didn't turn in her story at the end of the semester for her professor, and she basically didn't get a grade, and her mother's really frustrated with her. And so at the end of the night, she's, the daughter slips her story under her mother's door to read. And so here's, here's the, the end of the chapter. Later that night, I read my daughter's short story. It was about an airline attendant. Her name was Amanda. Just a short aside, the dad left the mother for a woman named Man, Mandy, so it's Amanda. 
I had to laugh out loud. There was not a side to take. That was what Jonathan and I had told her, but clearly Rachel had taken my side. In the short story, Amanda contracts a venereal disease, one she is not aware of. She meets a new man in every town. She takes each one back to her hotel, and she has sex with him. One of her lovers has a job in finance. He has a wife who is a teacher at an elementary school, like the mother. The man comes home from his trip to Paris, guilty, and wants to make love to his wife, but she is tired. She turns him away. At the end of the story, Amanda, the flight attendant, discovers her condition. She thinks about all the men she fucked, one in every town. What can you do, she says to herself, downing her penicillin with a slug of vodka. <laughs> Life is a bitch. It was a mean story. She was a good writer, my daughter, and I wish that she turned it in. Thank you so much. Um, so Very Nice was my favorite book of the summer by far. I mean, it was just a really, <laughs> just such a sharp um, and, and fun read. And I'm curious, you know, a lot of the times um, books spring from specific inspiration, whether something in the news or something in the writer's own history. Um, there are certainly a lot of newsy items, not newsy items, but there are, this book engages with the presidential election, yeah. uh, engages a little bit with global warming, engages a little bit with Me Too. Um, but I'm curious whether there were any other ideas or specific memories or people that sparked very nice. Yeah, this book started as a short story, which was the first chapter, because I really did want to play with Me Too, and I always wanted to write about the whole student-teacher affair situation, because I just find it so fascinating. It's such an abuse of power, and even though now it's really, really bad, I think it's just always been done in the history of professors and students. Students are always like, my male writing teacher, they're like, it's, I don't know if it's going to stop, but now it's really bad. So I wanted to write about that, and I wanted to make it a little bit more complicated, because if you read the first chapter, which I'm too shy to read out loud, she really, really comes on to him. So it's like, well, here's a dilemma. And so that's how it began. And then as I'm writing, I'm very much a stream of consciousness writer, and I wrote this book not that long after the election. And so I found that like I was sort of writing a literary soap opera, but the world just kept coming in because I like to go into the heads of my characters. And so this is what they're thinking about. And so how do you keep like the loss of Hillary's put in loss out of a book, how you keep gun control, it's all in there. People go on Facebook because that's sort of what we do. That's even what I as a writer will do if I'm like, if I'm writing really, really well, for some strange reason I have to stop and check my social media, which makes no sense. And so that's what these characters do. And so it just, it wasn't, none of it was really planned is what happened, but it all is in there. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So I mean, none of it was planned, but it's a book that it, it has a very, um, well-designed structure. Yeah. You know, there there are these alternating voices. They're all in first person. Um, and I, I, how did you? You know, just as a craft question, how did you keep it all straight? How did you um, decide which voice was going to carry what part of the story, and and, and, keep, and and really develop different voices for all, all of them? Yeah, I mean, I'm not an outliner and I'm not a planner, but because I had so many different points of view, it gave my book an instant structure because I had an order. It was going to be Rachel the mother, Zahid the professor, and then Chloe the sub -letter. And then twice, only twice, the father comes in. So basically I would do each four characters and then I'd go back to the beginning. And every time I'd start, you just keep moving the plot along. Mm -hmm. And I didn't outline or plan anything. But what I did realize is that one character is the writer's sub -letter, And it makes no sense that she's in the book. Like I, didn't even, I don't know why I wrote her. She's just what came into my head. But I think I was around page 80 or 90 and I realized like, she's got to be in this book for a reason. So I wove her in, and somehow the subletter, her sister is a writer who's a good friend with the Heat, and it turns out that her boss is the father of the family Connecticut. So the way she's a real linchpin, she has to be in the story. And I think once I figure things out as I go, then I just work backwards and I make it work. So I pretty much, every time I write, every time I open the file, I never move directly forward. I always go a little bit backwards, and I sort of keep, go back in and then move forward. And so by the time I get to an end of a draft, I'm really at the end of like my tenth draft because I've been rewriting the beginning so, so many, many times. Yeah. So I never. Sometimes people say, "Oh, there's this cliche with writing or about the shitty first draft," and that's just not how I work as a writer because by the time I get to the end of my first draft, I've got something polished or I wouldn't have kept on going. And yet this book came pretty quickly. Really quickly. Yeah. And how is it different? Like I mean. 
Do you have your other books come quickly, or was this a different experience? This was a different experience because this is a book. I mean, I wrote one other book with two points of view. It had two points of view. It was my very first novel, Twins, was each twin. But this is five points of view, and it's a little bit longer than my other books, which tend to kind of just they go just past novella length. It's like I just make it. But this book is um, it's over 300 pages, so that's good. And it just came quickly. <laughs> you don't get paid by the page. You don't. You know? But I just really wanted to finish just so badly. It was just so strange. I was so motivated. I, I, I didn't have any readers in this novel, which is not how people write. I didn't, I didn't bounce it off of anybody but my agent. And I, I just had him give me deadlines. And I'm like, hey, by this date, I'm going to give you something. And one time we had a deadline. And he said to me, he's like, Marcy, he loved it. He's like, I've never had like a client give me something with as many typos as this before. <laughs> but I just wanted to make my deadline so badly because he told me I could miss it. And I'm like, if I miss my deadline, there's there's absolutely no point. And yeah. So and I don't know, and I didn't know I was gonna write as quickly as I did it. So so interesting. It is interesting. And I don't know if this experience will happen again. And I actually tried to have my agent give me a deadline after this book came out, like about six months into it, and the deadline just came and went, and I wrote nothing for it. So I, I can't repeat that experience, which I really wish <clears throat> I could. And he's really lovely. He's like, if this isn't working for you, that's fine. But so, usually for me, the time in between books is more difficult than the time when I'm actually writing. It's hard to land on the subject that I want to work on. So a lot of writers know what they want to do next. And you're not one of those No, writers. I wish I were one of those writers. So, <laughs> yeah. One of the inspirations, or not necessarily inspirations, but you've written about how this book um, derives in part from your love of soap operas. Yeah. Um, and I know that you're, you used to be a film critic, and you are a really astute, smart consumer of TV and films. Yeah. Um, do you do you find that the, in the, those fallow period between books, are you watching a lot of TV? Are you watching a lot of movies? Or is is that part of your percolation? Process. It's just so great because I can say yes. Like it's so <laughs> yeah. fantastic to be able to say yes. I've been watching General Hospital for twenty years and it's really good for my writing. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like true, but I had no idea at the time. Do you know what I mean? And if I were to give writers advice, I wouldn't say watch a lot of TV. But I feel like TV is so smart right now that TV. It's very strange. I used to be all about film, and I'm finding film so hard to carry. It's, Two hour story arc, or even an hour and a half, where I'm finding TV is just to be a lot more brilliant these days, and so it's interesting. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. So you you recommended Fleabag. I read it. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you're recommending that's brilliant, brilliant? Well, if anybody hasn't watched it, it just it just came to its art, but it's Jane the Virgin, mm. and it actually ended so beautifully. So what I really love with writing is is a circle. Like, and I love for things to come back to the circle, and I, I think it just happened like a beautiful ending came all the way back to the beginning. And I know that over a five year period of time that they couldn't have had all that plan, but it's just amazing with what a writer can do. And that show is actually about, it's a complete over the top soap opera, but it's a woman who wants to be a teacher and at a certain point she ends up becoming a writer. And I was like, no, whatever you do, don't be a writer. Like I was, <laughs> I was really rooting for her to keep her teaching job, but it really works out beautifully where you, you kind of find out that the whole show was, was her life and what she's written. It's just gorgeous. Oh, that's great. It's really funny. Yeah. So this book is, is pretty cinematic as well, yeah. and I'm curious if you can tell us whether there are any TV or film uh, options in the works. Oh yeah. <laughs> I don't know how much you can tell us. I don't know how much I can tell you because it hasn't been announced as an official deadline news variety story, but it has been optioned. And it's the idea is it's going to be a limited TV series because it's all about TV. It's not about film anymore. Kind of like Big Little Lies, like a like a ten hour kind of show and by really young people who've got stuff in the theaters right now and they're doing Meg Walter's book, The Interesting. Oh, oh great! Wow. Yeah, yeah, they're amazing. I'm just so psyched about it, but I won't say their names. But you could like go look at Meg Walter and see who's doing your film <laughs> and then figure it out. <laughs> that. Yeah. So. We know you're interested in and influenced by TV, but obviously you're a writer yeah. and, a, and a big reader. Um, I'd love to hear what you've been reading lately that inspires you. All right, we were all supposed to be prepared for this. One. Yes, we were going to prepare for this. One. I know. And then I was just thinking more about like what what I had been like. I've read a lot of books. Sometimes when I have a book come out, I read a lot of contemporary fiction just to see what's going on and who I'm going to be compared with. But the thing is, if I read something 
that I don't like, I'm never going to say it because that's just no. That not, would be really rude. It's not cool. Yeah. So I read like a bunch of books in the last month that I've been really unhappy with. So I'm not saying okay. any of them. I'm reading a debut novel right now, which which won't come out until 2020. And somebody wants me to blurb it, and it's just such a relief because it's really good. Oh, good. I know. I'm like, oh, thank goodness. And it's called Sad Janet. And the nice thing, they said, Janet, this writer, this is like, it sounds so braggy. She actually, she's younger than I am. She really loved my book, Bad Marie. Yeah. And so, Sad Janet is sort of like a play on the title. Amazing. Yeah. So, she's really thrilled that I'm reading it. She's kind of been, like, she's been writing me emails for like the last two years. I'm like, who is my friend, this email woman? Is she really nuts? But I always write her back because it's kind of like she's my friend Lucy. So, when she sold the book to Riverhead, I'm like, oh my God, Lucy. Amazing. Yeah. But so, so her book, when it comes out next year, I think it's going to be really good. So we'll look out for Sad Yeah, Janet. but that's, okay. yeah, Sad Janet. What about older books? Older like books. Like, are there authors you return to again and again? Yeah. Um, I used to be a big Haruki Murakami fan, and so I read a lot of his books over and over again. Which, strangely, I mean, they're always about, like, the ordinary young man who does extraordinary things. And I think I've always sort of had that sort of idea, except instead of the young man, I was always writing about the pretty young woman. But it was sort of like the same idea that you kind of you live in this boring world and then have interesting things happen. I don't think this book is like a Murakami novel at all, but it's sort of the same idea. And I used to read a lot of like, I mean, it was sort of jumping ahead to your question about short sentences. Or I studied at the University of Southern Mississippi, and my writing teachers there were Frederick Barthelme and Mary Robeson. And I actually genuinely love their work, so it was so great to like get into that strange program in Mississippi. But they're sort of known for, they, they, were, they were the famous minimalists, and they were published in the New Yorker all the time. And, and I, I never thought of myself as a minimalist writer, but it turns out I write some minimalist fiction a little bit, like just short sentences. I don't know if that's minimalist. No, very short sentences, yeah. and very short paragraphs. And um, and then in this book, you're slamming a writer who writes really long sentences. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've always felt like the writers who win awards, by the way, has always been like a chip on my shoulder. The people who win the big awards always write the long sentences. And so, <laughs> there you have it. Interesting. I don't know. You're, yeah. 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 You no, as a, as, a, as a book reviewer, I, I can say I really appreciate short sentences. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think that um, you know not everybody knows how to deploy them as well as you do. Yours are really sharp. Like little bee stings, yeah. you know, which is perfect. Um, one thing I'm curious about um, was whether you did any kind of research for the book, or whether it all was just sort of in your head. Like, because you have people in the book, you have, you know, you have a fiction writer, you have a teacher, you have a student, you have a finance person, and a few other finance people. Yeah. Um, there's different roles in the world, and I wonder how much of that just came from your own experience, or did you like go and research like what it's like to work for? hedge fund or whatever. I told that was the one thing I looked up was like the hedge fund writer because I've always I, yeah I don't I still don't know what people in finance do and so I just kind of googled it and I looked at some terms and I read some articles and I was like acquisitions and I just put in enough words and I felt like flowing can be really convincing yeah yeah so that was a little bit of research the writer's part was no research at all right it was very funny because I really do mock writers yes to like an enormous degree and the funny thing is I really love writers I was just telling Kate like I love writers parties where people just get drunk and have fun like I feel like we're like a really good group of people for the most part so that I, I felt worried about making fun of them but I I did it anyway because when I, I don't get that many ideas so I just run with them and then I hope I don't get into trouble but otherwise this book wasn't research and I wonder I'm gonna have to write new things I feel like eventually if I want to branch out into new territory I'm gonna Go that path. Like learn something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, right. But I mean, why branch out? There's that. Yeah. I I, I, right. I wonder what happens. Not that I'm encouraging you to write a sequel. I don't really think that's your vibe. But um, but I I'm wondering if you thought at all about what happens to these characters after the book ends. Yeah. And, like you just imaginatively know where they go to or what happens. Yeah. I think I, I do. And this is something I've done in my other books. And Kate has like. I don't, I like an open ending. I really do it on purpose. And I have, it's an interesting thing because sometimes I read reader reviews of, of the work that I do and I really, some writers, people have read this book and if you haven't read it, I won't spoil it, but you have to get to the very last line to know what happens in the plot. But at the same point, then it just ends. It ends like boom, as if like that screen went black. 
And so some people just love that. And other people, I've read reviews where they're like, there's no ending, I can't stand it. Uh -huh. And so it's interesting, but I do know, like I kind of know what happens next. You know what I mean? Like I know where I've left this character. Like the, there's like Zahid who's working really feverishly on a novel by the end of the book. So he kind of ends in what you think is a terrible place. But if you think about <coughs> it, he's working, everything is going to be golden for him. Yeah. Like, I know that, so I hope the reader knows it too, but you have to think a little bit. And, um, like, with my novel, Bad Marie, I, I leave this character in a bathtub, drinking whiskey, because, like, she's really happy. But if you think about it, like, five minutes later, the police are going to come knocking on the door. And I know that, and I want the reader to know that, but I leave it there. Like, I leave this happy ending where I know it's going to be miserable after. So, but I do know these things, but I kind of let you decide if, it, if you want to take it into another direction, and I did that. And the last line of my novel, The Red Car, it ends, I think the last line was, she was hungry. And so that kind of tells you everything, like the whole, like she wants life, she wants more. But that's where I leave it. And so, it's, so I do, I do know, like I just said, I did just at a book club, it was really funny. I mean, people write, raised their hands and I, like, like we did a poll, like people wanted to know if the mother and father were going to get back together. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was curious about that as well. Oh yeah, they're totally not. No. <laughs> <laughs> the dad is going to want to, the mom is going to be like, are you kidding me? Yeah. So. Yeah, so yeah, the dad tires of his new, younger, uh, yeah, there are more. He lives in this tiny little apartment, he wants his house back. He's tired of buying, buying $28 burgers yeah. and restaurants and try back up. Um, <laughs> I, I wonder how much you, do you miss your characters when you're done with the book? Do you, yeah. Because they've really been living in your head. I do, I do miss them, and I also, I really like them. And, and so the interesting thing about this book is I really like these characters, and later, like now, that I know so many people think these characters are terrible. Roxanne yes. <laughs> Gayer reads this book, and, and, and this lovely little just for Goodreads, but she's like, despicable characters. And she said you love the book. And then I went back and I said, like, why are they despicable? And I'm like, oh yeah, this person cheated on this person. <laughs> yeah, this person gave this person a disease. And I'm like, oh, I guess they are really bad. But I didn't know that when I was writing it, because I was in their heads, and so I actually like love all of them. Nice. Yeah, it's really nice, and so I'm still surprised by how many people don't like them. But then I, I, I now that I've reread the book, I'm like, I guess there are real reasons for that. But yeah, like the one character in the book who doesn't do anything wrong to anybody else is the dog. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know what? There was this NPR review, like it said that she does something wrong too. They call, they say even what? even the even dog princess they say slash even, Posey does something bad. Yes, yeah, even the dog is unfaithful. That's true. <laughs> the dog quickly attaches herself. To, she's just adapting to new circumstances. Yeah, but she but she doesn't. She chooses a new owner at the end of the book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so now, obviously, you, you know, you've got these human characters, but the dog is a really not just a, a you know. Sometimes animals are just symbols, yeah. and the dog is sort of a symbol. The dog is a thing that people want or don't want, you know, for various reasons. But the dog does have a personality in the yeah. book. Um, have you written about dogs before? You know, there was a dog in my first book, and then there hasn't been one since. And I don't even, I don't have dogs anymore. Kate's a dog person, I have cats, but... But you're a poodle person. Yeah, I am a poodle person, and they're, they're really, they're just, I just love them. And so Rachel's here, because there's a dog at our bus stop that I just love that dog so much. And yeah, so it was fun to put it in, and I didn't know that the dog was going to be such a big character. Yeah. And that was actually one of the few things I did have to do when I was revising, is I had to remind myself, like, wait, there's a dog. So I would go back and cut the scene, and I would... I had sure to well, make sure the dog was Yeah, I made sure that the dog was getting water, or the dog was on walks, or the dog in the last scene has to bark, but I really had to make sure that she was in it, so she, she got some revision time. That's interesting. Yeah. So, so part of that process sounds like what people do when they're making a, a, a film, the whole sort of question of continuity. Yeah. Like, because I, I know that we've all been annoyed watching a movie or reading a book where there's like a character who just seems to disappear. Yeah. yeah. So it totally makes sense that you have to go back and make sure the dog is getting taken. Yeah, I'm actually watching this TV show <coughs> called Modern Family, and there's one family that has a dog in it all the time, and the, the dog is a main character, but there's another family that has a cat, and they leave that cat out all the time. <laughs> and Nina's like, where's Larry, where's Larry? So, <laughs> so sweet. He wants the cat to have more stories. <coughs> you do neglect it. Yeah. One thing that you have uh, written about or talked about is how much you like to write in public spaces. Yeah. Um, coffee shops. Um, I know that when you were writing this book, we were having some writing days at Daisy Mocha. Mm -hmm. I remember watching you. I was working on something that, just a little essay, but you were writing a whole book. 
And I remember it just your focus was really intense, and you would like play with your hair. Yeah. So they're right. Um, <laughs> I know. I didn't even realize that. I didn't know at the time when we were working together that I was writing a book at the time. Oh really? Yeah. I didn't know that this was a book. You're just rolling around with this. No, story it was just. I, I think I got to page like 100 or 80, and I realized it was really a book. So. Have you gotten up to 100 before and, and abandoned it? I have. Well, I've mainly, no, mainly by 60 I've abandoned it. Okay. So I think at that point I know. Yeah. It's like a threshold. Yeah. But in yeah, public spaces, it's funny because I don't think they're really good places to write. And I, I mean, I used to work, you know, in a writing center. And yeah, people would say people would watch me write there and I didn't know it because some of you are like smiling or people like really happy. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That part's weird. Like you're really exposed when you're writing in a public place. But I think when I'm at home, I just always want to do something else. Like I always, like if I have too many distractions, or if I want to clean up, or I just do want to watch TV, or I think one day I'm gonna get, I'm gonna have that room that I want to write in because I think I would. I, and sometimes I write at home. I do occasionally, but mainly there's so many times where I'm like, I just have to get out of here. Yeah, so, and it works for me. Like so, what's like the ideal public working space for you? Is um, it a coffee shop or is it a library? No, it's it's definitely like now. Now it's a coffee shop, and it has to be a coffee shop where it's not too crowded, and they have to, people can't really talk in the coffee shop, which, you know, doesn't really work because it's a coffee shop. Like a library quiet yeah. coffee shop. Right. So I, I take, and so I take my headphones with me wherever I go, so I, I tend to put on my noise canceling headphones in the coffee shop, and then I like good coffee. And then I can write in really bad spaces too, as long as I have my headphones. If I, if I go to a cafe and I don't have my headphones, then, then it's like a wasted trip. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, are there certain kinds of scenes that you feel like you have to be at home to write, or can you write sort of anything? Do you really like lose yourself? In I think I really lose myself. I mean, this, well, this book was just a weird one because I was so, it was kind of nuts how much I wanted it to write it so fast. I don't know what that was about, and I don't think I'll ever get to that place again. But I'd be like, if I don't write two pages, I can't go swimming, or I just had to get two pages done before I did anything else. And so I'd be in a cafe, <coughs> And I'd end up writing something like really intense, and I was in the wrong spot, but I had to finish my two pages. And so I wrote like a sex scene in the cafe, and I was like, there were people around, and I felt really uncomfortable. <laughs> but I didn't know I was going to be writing it. And I think I wrote one scene. I remember I was in like I was in local, which is this tiny little cafe across the street from where I yeah. live. And I know the scene that I was writing, and the, and the mother and father was the scene where they're fighting at each other. Like think she throws the phone at the TV, and it's really intense. And I wanted, there's people talking too loud, and I, I just picked up my computer and I moved tables. And it turns out they have tables where you're not allowed to put your computer. Uh -huh. and, and I was writing, and somebody actually interrupted me to tell me that I couldn't sit there. And I was like, are you kidding me? And so I laughed, and I didn't finish the scene at the time. I'm really surprised I didn't somehow make it into the book. Right. You know, because <laughs> there are a lot of sort of rude little moments. Yeah. Um, I don't try to write at that cafe anymore. I still go there, though. <laughs> I just said that publicly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was like a, and you, you probably don't even want to share the name of the, the your new favorite coffee shop. Right. Um, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, I to, it's, 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 it's in Bloomfield, though, so, yeah. It's 23 Skidoo. I can share it, because people aren't going to go to Bloomfield, are they? It's, it's a really good spot. <laughs> I haven't been there yet. It's really nice. But I hear it's about things, it. it. Yeah. It's, about it's it. really, really big. They have beautiful plants, and they have good coffee. Nice. Yeah, that's good. Do you, um, <laughs> so I'm curious about these books where you've gotten to page 60 and then you've abandoned it. Yeah. Like, how many are there? Of, how many of those little misshapen creatures are there? And do you ever go back to them <laughs> or mine them for parts? You no, know, I mean, I actually have one, I have one, it's like a short novel that, that got rejected. That was, a, uh, yeah, I know, it was awful. It was only about 200 pages. Where is it in the order of your books? It was after Bad Marie. And it was set on a spaceship. I wrote about a sad girl who's on a spaceship and she can't go home. And it was kind of fun writing about outer space and that was really kind of cool, but then I had no idea what to do with the plot. And then it just got really stuck. And I, I'm kind of glad that it got rejected, but it must have been okay because my agent sent it out. But that was that was hard. It's really hard to write a book and have it be rejected. And then, yeah, I bet. Yeah. And then, yeah, I mean, that was the longest period I went in between novels. Like, Battery and the red car is about seven years between. Oh, okay. Yeah, and that sucked. And so I think the funny thing, and I, I know this from other writers, and it doesn't even matter how successful you are or how quickly you do it, that every time you sit down to write a new novel, you, you think, oh no, I might not be able to do this again. It seems so unfair.
because you should have you should have gained that sort of confidence at a certain point. Yeah. Do you think this book gave you confidence? Um, I don't know because now I have what do I do now? <laughs> yeah, it did give me confidence. It totally gave me confidence. And but at the same time I'm sitting down to write right now and I'm at this page. I'm just like on something that's like twelve pages long and I'm like, am I gonna make this long or am I gonna make it short? Like I have to sort of Right. Things get past the point where I'm like, I don't like this very much, so I better make this into a short story. So I'm at this place where I'm writing, but I'm putting all this pressure on myself because I don't know what I want it to be. But I want to keep writing it because I'm not working on what I'm writing right now that I'm not writing at all. So, yeah. I mean, is it is part of it almost just like exercise? <coughs> like you're just doing it, yeah. Be, you know, to kind of keep your chops. Yeah. I mean, this wasn't supposed to be a novel, by the way. Like, this was a short story. And then I didn't know what to write next. And my friend who's a writing teacher said, well, this is what I tell my students. She treated me like I was a student. She said, right from the point of view of the mother. She's like, that's what I tell all my students. I'm like, OK. So I did that. And then I wrote from the point of view of the professor. And then I did the subletter. And I had about 40 pages. And that was a lot. And I thought, this isn't going to be my next novel. So forget it. But I actually stopped working on this for about three months. Mm -hmm. And then I wasn't writing. And I said, like, oh, well, this was fun and easy. Why don't I just go back to that? Sometimes I think if something is too easy or too fun, I'm going to just stop. And so, so going back to it was really a good decision. But I, I think I was at like a 40 page marker, and I was like, well, I'm not going to commit to this. And then when I couldn't come up with another idea, I was like, well, I might as well go back to it. It's interesting. Yeah. It's not the process I hear other people do. I'm not sure. I mean, I think every writer's process is different. I think every writer's process is yeah. really different, too. Yeah. But the, I'm fascinated that you that you're able to go that far into a book and then and then leave it behind. Yeah. I mean, do you think the girl in the spaceship is ever going to be published? I think people say that, or, or you know, Lizzie yeah. Skirt. People are like, why don't we just publish it online or this or that? But I think I, that book is just too painful for me to go back and look at. So maybe it's something else. Maybe it's a script. Yeah, it could be. I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want to look at it though. No, no, no. Yeah. Don't do that to yourself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what kind of reaction? I mean, obviously you've gotten great reviews. Yeah. Um, but I'm curious about reaction to this book by, for instance, um, people who know you, fellow writers, because there are so many writers. There's such a sense of writers, the writer's life being a little bit lampooned in this book. Yeah. And also, um, what did your mother think of that? Oh yeah. <laughs> Because it's a lot of mother daughter. It's a lot of mother stuff. It's a lot of mother daughter stuff, and I think <laughs> my mother didn't like this book when she mm -hmm. read it, and she said the reason why she didn't like it. I made this. I let her read it in galley form because she begged me for it, and then in galley form they're typos, and she said that the typos just drove her so crazy that she couldn't enjoy the book. And now that it came out and it's got good reviews, <coughs> she was able to reread it and enjoy it. So that was great. Or because it's upsetting when your mother doesn't like your book. It's really hard to be a mother. And then I know that there are like lines in this chapter, like I'm writing about like a 19-year-old daughter, but the whole section about a seven-year-old girl wanting a bunny, that's my daughter Nina, still asks me for like a bunny every day. And I'm never getting her a bunny because we have two cats and she doesn't get a bunny. But I put it in this book and so she's gonna get older and recognize it. And there's something just dangerous about writing and having your family read it and having your friends read it. And so it's, it's scary. And my novel, The Red Car, is really scary because you know there's an ex-husband who could read that book and be really angry at me. But I've heard that he's just not reading it, so that's awesome. But <laughs> it is awesome. It's really awesome. But like, if I have an idea and I want to earn money, I like I better write this. But I try to change things, and I'm really sensitive to it. But for terms of other writers, I've just gotten like like great response. It's just so thrilling. Like sometimes. I've been called like a writer's writer. Like I think there's like I think more writers sometimes know me than like the general public or something like that. So. Is that what a writer's writer means? I don't know what it means. Maybe you know what it means. I think it means that other writers like your work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not that other people don't. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Linick said in her review that I was a writer's writer, so I can say that, right? Nice, mm -hmm. nice. Okay. <laughs> so Nina is ten now. Yeah. Your daughter. Um, how old do you think she needs to get before you'll let her read your work? We'll say we'll say it's 35. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know she's going to start just cracking those books in a few years. Yeah. Her. I mean, right now she has this idea that everything, like she tries to ask me what I'm writing about, and I start to tell her, but I leave a lot out. She just thinks it's so boring, and she likes to read, really? like, oh my god, and she likes to read fantasy. And so, like, 
I was just so beyond boring to her, so I'm hoping to keep that in her mind so that she's not interested in my work. But, <laughs> but, but we did pick up this book when it was a book, and, and, and at first she was so not interested in it, it would hurt my feelings, but then we just started looking through it, and she had this game where she was just looking for curse words, and I told people this. <laughs> and there's like one page where the F word is used five times, and so we were just going through this book. She's delighted by she that. She was laughing so hard. <laughs> she's like, you know, you bring your kids up not to curse in public, and, and look what I do. So it's good, but I hope she doesn't read my book for a really long time. But I can't stop her because you know she could go to the library and she's in the library right now and just do it on her own if she wanted to. I don't know. I guess I could forbid her. No, no. I mean that'll just make her read. Yeah. Right? So we'll just deal with that later. But right now I'm boring. It's good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna keep that. I think it's kind of good for mothers to remain boring in general. Like you know, you don't want to be so fascinating that your kids feel. Then you see some mystery there. Oh, good, yeah. You saw my daughter came in right before. I don't know what she wanted, Martin. But it was just like she's just irritated for me for not meeting her needs. Oh. But she didn't want to stay for my reading like for even a second. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're about to open it up to questions from the audience. But I have one last question, which is sort of, um, I, I feel like it's been touched on. Is like, do you ever have, do you have an ideal reader in your mind when you write? And who is your ideal reader? Like Elizabeth Gilbert, she talks about that really publicly. Like she actually <coughs> writes for like her ideal reader. And like, really? Yeah. Like she writes every time she writes a book, she thinks she's writing it for a friend, and she thinks about that person. Mm. And I think I'm really writing for myself. Mm. And so that's really problematic because because I'm a little bit odd, and I don't know. I'm not the ideal reader in terms of like the marketplace or even the review world. But I think I'm really just like. What pleases me next to keep writing? And like, if I'm not enjoying myself writing, then why am I going to keep going? And that sounds so narcissistic right now to say that I'm writing for myself. No. Yeah. Oh, good. That's right. That's. I think that's the truth. Yeah. Good. Oh, good. Well, thank you so much. I think Eileen has got a microphone, and um, if you have a question, raise your hand. I think the microphone is there. It's working now. Great. Thank you so much. That was a great conversation. Thank you very much, ladies. Um, I'm going to roam around, so please put your hands up high so I can get your questions on that side. Um, I absolutely loved this book. It was also my favorite book of the summer, maybe even probably could be for the year. And I feel like I personally have told a million people to read it because it's phenomenal. I had two, uh, I had a comment and a question. I read the book, I loved the ending. And it reminded me, having not read anything about you, of Edward Alpe. Oh. So I was interested to see that you had gotten a fellowship from? Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to ask a little bit about that, and then also just to um, ask about the, the intentional flatness of the daughter's character. Right. Like, where did that come from? Because I found it really compelling. Right. And um, I don't know if it was relatable, but it just was so interesting to me. The, the lack of dimension of her in some ways was great. So I'll start with Albi, I guess. And that's, I mean, that's a great residency because it actually is his ranch and it's in Montauk. And, and he was still alive when I went there. So he would come and deliver the mail. So one day he brought over the mail and he said hi to me. And I said hi back. And that was really meaningful. And in Montauk, I don't know if any of you have been there, it's just like a magical place. It's, yeah. you know, the end of Long Island. And, and it was about a two miles or a mile away from the beach and there were bicycles and I had a really hard time working when I was there because I love the beach so much and so really it was like somebody gave me a one month beach vacation which I felt like I, I was deserved in life so <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't work that hard while I was there because I was riding the bike and going to the beach all the time and editing the novel and at the time there were other writers that would just there were other writers who, would, who were there there was a woman across the hall from me Tracy, and she literally didn't go to the beach until the last week that she was there. Because she's like, I'm here to work. And I was like, who are you? And so, so, so residencies are an interesting place. That's, a, that's an interesting one, because I've been to more than one where it was really tiny, and you shared a kitchen, and so your personalities had to blend, and sometimes that, that was difficult. Yeah, that was really hard. So that was an interesting summer or a month. Did that answer that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was, it's really lovely that he, he made that available, and it's a really magical space. But it's not for everybody because you don't get taken care of. Like if you go to McDowell, by the way, they give you these little baskets and there's lunch in them. And they make you these amazing dinners. And you, you have to shop for groceries at Aldi, so it's like, yeah, yeah, that kind of stuff. 
And then the flatness, I think teenagers, I mean, I think they can be really flat. And I feel like this character, Rachel, isn't flat, but I think she's just trying so hard to protect herself that, that she's not revealing it. And one of the main things when I worked with an editor that was really great is that she actually pushed me to make Rachel less flat than she was, so look at that. Because I think when it was the first round when I wrote it, she was, she was so sure that she'd lost this character of the heat that she kind of gave up really early. And the story happened the exact same way, but when I revised it, we kept her more oblivious. We kept her wanting the professor more, so the tension was just there more and more. And I think it was so hidden that like he was oblivious to it, but I kind of put it in her voice. So like so she kept on desiring him until the very end. So that was a change. Thanks, I enjoyed the talk a lot. Uh, I am curious, um, the chapter you didn't read, which I've got an excerpt from, um, it's timely, it's me too, but as you said at the beginning, this is a very old topic in some ways. There are a lot of plays and novels which have this teacher-student imbalance. What would you say is different from, um, about what you're doing um, in this? Um, I don't know if it's different. I mean, well, it's interesting. There's a, the hot book of the summer, which Kate reviewed, is um, Free Women. Yeah. And, and, and it's completely different. Like, they're, one of the points of view is a teenager who has an affair with her, her teacher. And it's totally abusive, and it's awful. And he really just uses his position in a wrong way, and he keeps it a secret. And he really destroys her life. And that can be a student-teacher relationship, and it's awful, and that goes to court. And in this case, with this student, I don't think it's going to ruin her life. I think she was out for experience. She had an experience, and she's going to move on. And I think that with most people, like your first sexual experiences or relationships don't always work out that well. And it would be great if they weren't your professor or they weren't your boss or, you know, but I, I, I think that she's not going to. Well, I could have ruined her at the end of this book, but I didn't. Right. That was a real choice that I made, by the way. Yeah, I think. But so I don't think. <coughs> I mean, I think they're all different. There's this book that's on um, the writer named Alexander Mazik, and he wrote a, a novel about a student-teacher affair in France. And I loved that book. I just thought it was so compelling. And later on, I read that that was actually like a real experience that he had with his student. And then I felt really icky. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Do you know that book? I do. Yeah. So, yeah. And, so, and so I don't think I would like that book if I knew that before I had read it. It's weird because there, you know, it is such a, um, it's such a an abuse of power, and it's so gross um, and, and predatory in so many cases. But I agree in this story, um, the way Rachel, you know, Rachel kind of going for this guy, and he's also, you know, a, a, a visiting professor of creative writing is sort of different from a typical professor. I mean, he doesn't, you know, this guy did not go through the academy. He's a he's a fiction writer, and. Um, He's a little bit older, but he's not, you know, disgustingly older. And uh, I kind of agree. I don't think I don't think by the end of the book you feel like her life was ruined by it at all. Yeah. I mean, the only danger is related to the relationship with her mother. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I know I do know. Like, I had a friend. Who's like, I just hated him so much. There are people that will just hate that character so much because of the boundary line that he crossed. That's fair. Yeah. People react to to this book really differently, which I find interesting. Really enjoyed the talk and looking forward to reading the book. Oh, Is that the first book I should read if I haven't been fortunate to read anything you've read? Uh, yeah, I think so. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, you said that you don't know what you're going to do next. Oh, I hate that. And yeah. that's not what I imagine. I imagine writers walking around with those little yeah. notebooks with I lots know. of ideas. So I want people just to give me their ideas. I say that jokingly, and nobody really. I know we. I gave her an assignment. Yeah, and I didn't do it. And you didn't do it. Yeah, she, and it was okay. it was a great assignment. And honestly, it's so strange. I was one of my processes as a writer is to get so unhappy that I finally have to write because I'm so unhappy. And Kate gave me this great assignment based on children's books, and it's so bizarre because I literally took those books out of this library, carried them, and I carried them to the beach. I took them with me everywhere, and I didn't even read them. <laughs> read them. This was this was really stupid, but you know, Marcy said, you know, I just don't know what I'm going to write next, and I hate, I hate, I have no inspiration, and I yeah. have this feeling, and I said, why don't you make somebody? Should, for some reason, we were talking about Beatrix Potter books, and I said somebody should write an adult, um, you know, social realist 
you know, satirical novel um, with human beings, but based on um, the tale of Jimmy Hackey or the tale or the tale of Tommy Tiptoes. It made me too nervous. Um, yeah, yeah, I didn't read them even. Isn't that weird? And I almost, I almost lost them, and I was worried about library fees. Uh, Unless it was, that's an open assignment for anybody who wants to. It seemed like a great, I did take them out of the library. Yeah, it's a, it's a good assignment, I'm sorry. I'm a difficult case sometimes. Yeah. But I wish, I mean, there are writers who are like that. And, um, I mean, there's a real variety of the fact that like, I wrote four books, it's like incredible. And then there can be, there are other writers at my age, which I won't reveal, who've written like a lot more. Some people write one book. Um, there's this writer who's more of like, She's really considered chiefly a women's writer, like Jane Green, and she had a book come out this summer. And I follow her on Instagram, and her writing isn't literary, but she just finished her new novel. I'm like, how is that even possible? She's like posting like she's like novel 20 in the books, and I'm just like, yeah. So I think she finishes a book and she starts a new book, and I think that's a really happy place to be because writing is actually there's this idea about writing and writing is suffering, and there are people and they talk about, oh my God, I only wrote a paragraph today and I spent six hours. And that's not my process because I really love to write. So if I'm going to sit down and write, I might as well write three pages in a burst. You know what I mean? So I just need the idea. And so maybe maybe Keith's idea was too abstract for me. Yeah. We'll find you some more ideas. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, so I loved it too. I just finished last week. Um, I really, out of all the characters, I love Chloe with a K so much, and I just wondered, is she okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chloe's great, by the way. Yeah. She works in finance, and she's just going to keep on making money. money. <laughs> she's just going to make money, but she's not an unethical person in that. That babysitter of hers, right. put your fingers in your ears if you haven't read it. She's going to move on. You know, people will move on. <clears throat> you think you get your heart broken, and then you're okay. But she's going to, she's going to, maybe she's a, what, what kind of real estate can you buy in New York? Uh, she's just gonna take off. Yeah, I, I felt like that was heart wrenching. But yeah. there's one scene with her and the babysitter that was really heart wrenching. Yeah, I felt for her too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Anyone else? Front row. Oh, oh front row. sorry. <coughs> Do you find it difficult or easy to create men characters? Men characters. That's such a great question. And. This is a book that has more men characters than I've done in a long time, actually. I usually don't write men characters, so I must find it difficult. And um, at the launch for The Red Car, Emily St. John Mandel interviewed me, and that's what she said, because she'd read all of my books, and she's like, you never write about men. And I was like, so unaware, and I was like, are you kidding me? I felt really embarrassed, and so I think I, I took that as a challenge. And so this book has two male points of view, and in a way, it wasn't that different than writing female characters, but sometimes, I, I mean, there's stuff about men and how they look at women, and so I think I was trying to have, a, I, I was trying not to be myself while writing about a man, but it didn't feel, it didn't feel that difficult. I gave my dad some of the dad stuff, you know, so that helps, knowing, knowing other men. Yeah, it's good, it's good to, you're, you're half of the population, so I feel like I should write about that. I mean, it was sort of insinuated that there was maybe some like inappropriate stuff happening between she and the babysitter, and I wasn't sure if that was just me reading into it or if that truly was. I know. I don't even know. Like, I don't know why I put that in there because it became a little bit icky. And in the beginning, it wasn't. And I think I just, at a certain part in writing, I was kind of just taking things over the top. But I think it was. Like, I think it wasn't cool what the babysitter did. But I think I'm thinking a lot about just like humans and what we can take. And I feel like, again, like I feel like the student's up with her professor and she's going to be okay. I feel like like this babysitter shouldn't have done what she did, but I feel like Chloe loved her for it. Like I feel like she actually wasn't damaged. I think people can get damaged or not damaged or everybody is damaged, but yeah, I don't think it was too bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think like that. I don't think the babysitter should have gone to prison or anything like that. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I also love the book. One of the things that I really liked about the narration is you heard what people were thinking, yeah. um, and then you would hear what they were thinking, and then also you know what they actually were presenting. 
So with Zahi, because you heard what he was thinking, he was like a total narcissist, you know, and it, it made it hilarious. Yeah. But did, so when you created that character, did, was that in your head at the beginning, like, this guy's gonna be a narcissist? Or as you were writing, where you were like, oh my god, this guy's a narcissist? Uh, that's such a great question. And see, I don't, I didn't, it's so funny because if I say that someone so he's writing insecurities and thoughts came from me, then I'm just like publicly admitting to him that I'm a narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so I don't know, like it wasn't intentional. Um, I can just say one thing. I have a friend who actually wanted me to, to say this about her, and, I, and I, no one's ever brought it up, and so here's my moment. This is special for you. Is there's, there's, a, there's a small part of this book that nobody ever talks about where Zahid has a friend who's dying of cancer, and, and he says, die tumor, die. And, and it really torments him. He's trying to write it, and he'll get a text saying, think die tumor, die. Yeah. And I actually had a, a friend who, who died of cancer, and I was on this text message list where this would happen to me. And, and I put it in the book because one day I was trying to write and I had to keep to my timeline and I get this text message saying time for you to think these thoughts because I'm having my chemo. And I put it, I put it in the book and so I tried to make it, in the end I felt so guilty about it. I felt like I was the worst person in the world. Like, and, and I was just trying so hard just to write and this is what I did to write that day. But I, I talked to her about it and I told her about it. And, she wanted me to tell people her name, which I never, I changed it so much, I made it into a man who was dying of cancer, but it was a woman, and her name is Ella Avery, because she wanted me to tell people, and this is the first time I've told people. Wow. Yeah. But, but in the end, what he does in the, in the story that he's writing is, I think he gives, he gives a character who's dying, he puts him into the book, and he gives him like this beautiful storyline. So I think I wanted to redeem him as a narcissist. Like, I think he's hateful, but he's true and he's honest, and I think, for the most part, with stream of consciousness, like I'm letting you all like hear all the twisted, twisted things people think, but we don't say them out loud. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's like true about life. If we don't say the things that we think about out loud, it's okay. We can get away with it. Yeah, as long as you don't tweet about it. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I, I have to say, I did relate to some of those things. Okay, you know, and great. It, it was like a human kind of like because he wasn't one dimensional, like yeah. you said. Yeah. Yeah. I thought he was pretty narcissistic, but I didn't think he would have put up more stink about leaving his wallet. I oh, I know. I don't know what that is, but that to me, I was like, oh, he was kind of decent. He didn't make a big fuss. I'll get it back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my own worry about this one. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, ladies, so much. This was fantastic, and we really appreciate appreciate everyone coming. Please do buy the book on the way out if you haven't gotten it.